Mr. Bailey. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Danielle Humphrey. I'm one of Monsignor Craig Harrison's attorneys. I'm joined today by his other attorneys, Kyle Humphrey, Craig Edmonston, H.A. Sala, David Torres, and Jared Thompson. We're also joined today by some of Monsignor Harrison's children and grandchildren who wanted to be here today to show him their support. In just a moment, Monsignor Harrison is going to be coming forward to read a statement he has written to explain things in his own words and to speak to his community. After he reads that statement, Monsignor Harrison and his attorneys will be available to answer your questions. So with that being said, I'm gonna invite Monsignor Harrison forward to read his statement. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for being here today I want to thank my children and grandchildren uh, who were able to get off work to be here. I've been silent for a long time. I've never spoken about these things. It was almost two years ago that Bishop Armando Ochoa called me into his office to put me on temporary administrative leave because of a phone call he said he received of an accusation against me. He wouldn't tell me what the accusation was. He wouldn't tell me where it came from. And the church's guidelines have always said that before a priest is removed, an investigation has to be done to protect his name. That did not happen. Bishop Ochoa told me he had no time to do an investigation because he was leaving office. He proceeded that weekend to come to St. Francis Parish and read publicly a statement that an accusation of misconduct had made, been made against me. For my parish, for my family, my friends, and for me personally, this was devastating. I waited for my diocese of Fresno to respond to me and to help me through the process, but to no avail. I believed it would be very quick if a competent investigation would happen. It, it would clear my name and I could be back to work in a week or two. But months passed, and still not one word from the Diocese of Fresno. Not even asking me if I was okay or needed anything. And it was difficult. I've spent 38 years of my life as a seminarian and a priest serving the Diocese of Fresno. You think that is your family? When the new bishop came in and I, I anticipated a very quick resolution. Finally, someone would investigate and my name would be cleared. Instead, I waited for months. Finally, the bishop contacted me and left a phone message on my recorder telling me that even though he'd only been in office for two months, he was going on vacation. My life was on hold. The next thing I hear about is from Teresa Dominguez, the bishop's spokesperson. She went on national radio and publicly defamed and accused me. And again, my family's life was shaken. It was blasted all over the news. I had a death threat and still not one word from the Diocese of Fresno. I finally got my first meeting with the bishop and Monsignor Frost of Christ the King joined me in that, and he's a canon lawyer and one of my good friends. The bishop told me in that meeting that he would get back to me right away within a week about the diocesan review board, that I would be given the opportunity to be interviewed, present, and any evidence that I could produce, I could give. This turned out to be untrue. I was never given any opportunity to respond to any accusation against me or to give any evidence in support of my innocence. To this day, right now, no one in the Diocese of Fresno has ever even asked me a question 
about the allegations, and it's almost two years. The bishop admitted in that meeting that Teresa Dominguez had made a big mistake. And he said he privately reprimanded her. And I said, that doesn't do me any good. She went public. You should go and defend my name. I was investigated by three de police departments and still not a word from the bishop. Finally, in April, after it became clear that the diocese had no interest in helping me, I was forced to file a lawsuit against Teresa Dominguez and the diocese for defamation. And then here is September 23rd. My brother Rick passes away. On October 9th, my family was gathering around. We were preparing for my brother's funeral, and the mail came, and there was a letter from the bishop. And technically, I was excited. I thought maybe it was a letter of condolences for my brother's death. But no, it was a letter threatening me that if I don't drop the lawsuit, I'm going to be punished. Then another letter came from the bishop reprimanding me for praying with other people. He was told, I was told that I could not participate in funeral services for my friends. I must stop posting my prayers and reflections on Facebook. I could not be seen or photographed in public wearing dark clothing. I'm not wearing dark clothing. And I could only celebrate the Eucharist if I was alone. I'd just been asked to say a prayer at Luigi's for a dear friend of mine, Rosina DeWar, who had passed away. I wasn't doing it as a priest, I was doing it as a friend of the family. And he said in his letter, he prohibits me from doing it. His, de his demands regarding my social media were so extreme, I feared that any post that I put relating to religion would be deemed a violation. That includes sharing events that were happening in my grandkids. They're here from St. Francis, Garces, Ra fundraising activities, charities that I've been involved in in this community, asking for food for food drives for the homeless. I have done everything. I have done everything I can to comply with the bishop's rules that he changes every day. But now the rules have gone too far. Above all else, more than being a priest or anything else, I am a Christian. And I have a responsibility as a Christian to help people in their time of need. How can I close my door to people that come to me for help? How can I refuse to comfort and pray for a mother who lost her child? I see Nellie Martinez right there. One of the first funerals I did of her child kidnapped and murdered. What do I do say, I can't? The bishop says I can't talk? How can I abandon the foundations, the charities, and the things I work for in this community that I love? Well, I can't. So therefore, today, I am announcing that I am resigning as the pastor of St. Francis Parish, I submitted a letter to His Holiness Pope Francis resigning as a Catholic priest because I cannot ignore my call from Christ to serve and minister to his people. And I've come to accept that I cannot do this with any organization led by people who are willing to sacrifice the gospel for politics and money. I have truly come to learn that through this process that some of the greatest trials in life are the greatest lessons. And the greatest lesson I have learned through this ordeal has come from you, my community of faithful people. Despite the obstacles we face, together we have been able to create and maintain our own faith community that does put the gospel over politics. It is because of you, your support, and the work we have done and will continue to do together that my faith has never been stronger. So while one chapter of my life is closing, 
A new chapter full of possibilities for all of us is beginning. I feel a call to ministry stronger than ever before. And I will continue to follow Jesus Christ. I will continue to preach. I will continue to lead a life. And as St. Francis said, I will go out and preach the gospel and if need to, use words. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you. Do you have any questions? Robert? Well, Father Greg, you've uh, established uh, uh, rapport with this community in such a way that you, you, you've been a counselor, you've been a therapist of sorts. Is that something uh, you might pursue? I don't know. I, I, I love talking to people. Um, I like counseling and working with people. But I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to find out where God's taking me. I'm just... He's taken me through so much and to here, and um, I don't know what he has planned, but I'm open. I'm open. I just know that I'm going to continue in ministry. I know that. Can you speak at all to the allegations that were brought against you? Well, I don't really know what they all are. <laughs> They're false, like we've always said. And this result is a result of the failure of the bishop in his obligations to seek truth and justice. We have the finest of men and an amazing, amazing gift from Christ to all of us who follow, being taken from us because the lack of transparency, the ability to manufacture your own rules, a complete lack of integrity. We want to go forward on the lawsuits. Let's put people under oath. We know it didn't happen. We've always only asked for the opportunity from the bishop to hear us. So the simple answer, they are, were false, they are false, they will always be false. Well, so you, um, has this um, shaken your faith or has it shaken it? Go over that part, I know this is- That I can tell you this. And anybody that's been through anything, you talk about what I've been through, I look at what Nellie has gone through, you know, to lose a child at five years old. It shook me to the core of who I am, but I have to tell you, my faith in Christ is stronger than it's ever been. And because of the friends and the people and the support and this community, that has all led me through. Like I said, it's for me, I, I've loved my priesthood. I don't think I would have changed one thing in the 34 years as a priest and four years as a seminary, I don't think I would have changed any of it. But the church isn't in a good place. It's not transparent. It's, there's no due process. I have never, ever, can you imagine working for somebody and have this going on where you have pledged your life and not one time has anybody ever called me and said, are you okay? Do you have food? Do you need anything? And that's not, what the, that's not what church is about. And hopefully this will change things in the church. I really hope. I really hope that this will change things in a church that I loved and served. Uh, Monsignor, what specific changes would you like to see from the church? Were this be a catalyst for change? Well, first of all, I didn't know when I got into this there's no ever due process. I mean, in this process, they've told me I have no civil rights. And this due process... Um, they, all the books that they give me that are say these are your directories and canon laws, they say the bishop is supposed to stand behind his priest and support him. They're supposed to investigate. They don't do any of it. And then they come out with new laws and say, oh, well, there's an exception. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm hoping that laws that will protect priests, we're in a weird culture today. You all know that. So many things going on politically, spiritually, and all. And I hope to be a part of that change because it's not fair to anybody. Um, I was hoping you could expand on the press release we got that was saying that the church was pursuing penalties or something against you for the lawsuit, and I was wondering if that played you a role in your off? decision to resign at all? Sure, let me ask, Kyle could probably word sure. that better. <clears throat> I've been working with Monsignor's Canon lawyers. The church lawyers are different than than those of us, the civil lawyers and the defense lawyers, 
they have their own set of rules. And for those of us that come from a background, this very democratic and American background of due process and a Bill of Rights, it is shocking. The way that it is set up is the bishop ultimately by himself decides what due process is and whether you get it. And so when this lawsuit was filed as the last venue, the last opportunity for Craig to, uh, for Father, I'm sorry, to clear his name, the bishop struck back and said, you will be punished. And we provided those letters at an earlier press conference. He was to be punished because he wouldn't drop his lawsuit. And it was a demand, a threat. And that's why this retaliation is unfolding as set forth in the press conference. You drop your lawsuit or else. And Monsignor, after two years, realized the bishop was never going to call a witness. He's never once asked us to provide the witness statements. We have a witness who lived in the home at one of the accusations took place who said the person making the accusation never lived there. And we've confirmed that with the people who ran the home. We have that. We've offered that. And, and piles of evidence. They've never given it to us, uh, this opportunity, to even ask Craig what happened. So they're going to punish him without that opportunity. They chose how to forward accusations and their findings against Monsignor without ever once conducting a single interview for the witnesses who could clear things up. It's outrageous. It's, it's one of the most profoundly disappointing things that I've ever seen as a lawyer to realize that their system is not our system. They have no regard for due process of law, for the rules of evidence, and they make choices that are, are incredibly damaging to innocent priests every day. Innocent priests have become the sacrificial lambs of, of the bishops now. In terms of punishment, it is inevitable that Monsignor will be punished because he won't drop the lawsuit. The other basis of the punishment is apparently the bishop thinks that Monsignor standing up for himself made people not like the bishop. And the remaining one is apparently the flimsiest of evidence to say Monsignor on the, the rules that have changed was a bad person and disobedient because he would go to funerals not as a Catholic priest but as a friend because his life has been this community forever. You don't stop being friends with people because they tell you the title of Catholic priest is no longer yours or will be taken permanently. You do it because your ministry of Christ that you're called to. So we think we have seen the so-called evidence of that disobedience that they're going to punish him for and it's so flimsy it is things taken off the internet by a person calling themselves Steve Loftus who if any of you are familiar that name is I've seen often in uh, editorials and postings to the Californian and other news organizations we don't even know if that person exists but using hearsay the flimsiest of which was saying that Monsignor was disobedient for narrating for what in the Catholic community is called the Stations of the Cross uh, of Jesus' path to crucifixion. The bishop, in throwing that against us, didn't even bother to look and see that that video was made five years ago. That's the level of proof that they require. It wouldn't even be admitted in a court where due process existed. The punishment is inevitable and as we indicated the bishop has managed to get himself I, it's a mystery to me. He's mysteriously become the sole judge as to the accusations against Monsignor based on their inadequate, incomplete and biased investigation. This has led us to this place where Monsignor's only justice is outside of the bishop's control.
and he cannot obey requirements that make him stop being a Christian and serving his call to Christ. So, to be clear, was the punishment that he would be removed by the bishop, you know, and force him out eventually? Is that what the punishment would be, or is it something else? The bishop doesn't have to tell you what it is. It can go from, uh, I'm going to say you're a bad person, to you can't be in charge of your parish, to you can't say the sacraments, to lay a cessation where you're no longer to be a priest, you live, you lose that title, um, or even to excommunication. But none of that is the, the ultimate, ultimately that outcome is, is not what we're concerned about. Depriving Monsignor of the chance, the calling, and the duty to serve Christ in ministry uh, is not worth it to him. The title of being a Catholic priest is not as important to the practice of faith as acting in faith and serving in faith. So those threats that we know the bishop would carry out in retaliation, we're past that. So the bishop can no longer level any punishment now that uh, Monsignor Craig resigned? Well, the, the bishop can do whatever he wants. That's, that is the fundamental truth of this process. Uh, this bishop came in from out of town, uh, much like a hatchet man hired by a company, uh, and he can fire people. And if you are at all familiar with how the relationship between civil law and uh, church law works, um, you don't have protections as an employee if you work for a religious organization. They're very limited rights. So the bishop can do what he wants at this point, like he always could have. It was the expectation of due process that leaves us disappointed. We thought before you punish somebody, you should find out what happened. If you come home and your cookie jar is broken and laying on the floor, it would be a bad parent who beat the kids and then later asked what happened. We don't think that this obligation that the bishop has to care for his priest uh, has ever translated into trying to do a good job of finding out the truth. And then my last question is just for Father Harrison. Throughout all of this, do you want to come back to be the you know, head of St. Francis of Assisi? Was that always your goal? Today? I, I always thought I was. I, I kept waiting weeks, months, years. But you know what? Enough is enough. And so um, today I'm telling you I'm resigning from any possibility of it. I, I will work in the community, I'll serve the community, but it will not be as Monsignor Craig Harrison at St. Francis Parish. Well, we have you briefly in Spanish, the ones that people have been by your side for these two years, any, any message for them? Yes, muchas gracias para todos los humentes, para la, la soporta, para la gratitud, y para sus oraciones. Muchas gracias para todo. I just wanted to thank the people for their prayers, their support, and all. Um, this town has a large Hispanic community. They've been so patient with my Spanish, with everything. But I have to tell you is, these are people of faith. And I, I don't want to ruin anybody's faith. This is not about faith in Christ. That's where our faith lies. Ralph? I know it's early but everyone knows you have one of the highest name recognitions in this community, and you're one of the most popular people in this community. Have you ever thought about running for office or <laughs> getting involved in politics? I hate politics. I hate it in the church, and I hate it in the regular. My friends are Republicans and Democrats and everywhere else. No. <laughs> Thank you. Okay? Is that Thank you. Thank you. someone who's part of the laity of the Catholic Church. I am deeply saddened by this news. 
I feel as if it's a corporate policy that wasn't reviewed or procedure that should have been there to protect you, to protect others like you. And I find it offensive that one of our, that my faith, and having been a member of Catholic charity, serving on the corporate board, advocate for many different things, that there is nothing there or that the bishop did not take the time out to give you the opportunity and the right that would belong in any workplace you know? to have a voice, to have the opportunity, and to prevent you such heartache. And that, that's words, why I have to move on. Words, yes. That's why I have to move forward. I understand that. And but I it appreciate it. it needs to be said, and I'm thankful that you're here to say that. And I know it hurts you because you've been through all of this. But we thank you, and we need real gospel, like what you live and what you teach with minimal words and such a man of action as St. Francis himself, right? And one who spoke like Mother Teresa and one who lives the gospel. And I pray that you will continue to be blessed and continue to, to bless. But your title of Monsignor is a legacy and will continue. And no one who didn't confer that upon you can strip you of that because that came from what you did for our community, our county, and beyond. And we love you, and we are with you, and we are sorry for this, but we're also thankful. Because just as when Dorothy Day served the community, and the priest didn't want Catholic to be associated with a Catholic worker, but she was living her faith, and after she passed, they were tripping over their cassocks to carry her casket. You live the gospel, you are helping us in our faith, and we love you. And no one can take away that truth. Thank you. Thank you very Let much. Um, and so we know we were at the St. Francis Church a couple days ago. Um, just curious what you were doing there. My one of my good friends, when you're a priest, families like adopt you. When I came here, first time I came here was 28 years ago. The Anton Giovanni family, nine children, they were my other family. And on Sunday nights, I would go to their house for dinner, and I would do all that. And uh, they all have considered me always their older brother. That's how their parents referred to me. And Kathleen passed away. And the family asked me to do the eulogy, which any lay person can do. And I wore a similar clothing. I went, and before the mass began, I gave the eulogy. Those are the things he's saying I'm not allowed to do. And I couldn't do that to my friend and my family, and I'm not going to stop. So, you know, that, that's a prime example of, of what's going on. And for two years, you want me to stop things, but you never, ever, and you change the rules, and you don't speak to me. I'm ready to move forward. I want to thank everybody. Thank you for coming out today and for your time. Thank you all for uh, coming. That wraps it up. Unless anyone has any additional questions for any of the attorneys, uh, if you have what you need, we'll uh, call it a day and just thank you for your graciousness and coming on such short notice. <laughs>